You're listening to Pitch Talks, bringing you the game. Hello, and thank you for choosing Pitch Talks, the working sport podcast series, helping passionate sports fans find the answers they are looking for when they're trying to pursue a career in sport. Today's episode is slightly different to usual, as I share with you some of the best career tips and advice from our last handful of episodes. So if you're interested in getting into technical broadcasting, training as an athlete, reporting, directing, or something else, then stay tuned. So let's get to it. This is Pitch Talks, bringing you the game. Our first guest is Claire Downey, technical broadcast manager for Formula E. Our conversation with Claire gave some fascinating insight into the rise of Formula E and how the sport is aiming to develop for the future. On top of this, Claire also shared her thoughts towards taking on as many internships and graduate schemes as possible to further build your employability credentials. So if you're looking to get into further education or another entry-level position, then this may be of interest to you. So as you mentioned, you know, you've completed two internships during your time at university, one with Team Bath and another with PGIR, supporting the England rugby team. And then, as you just then again said, being the first person to get a place at the Delta Tray Media's graduate scheme. How valuable were these placements in your career in terms of professional development? And would you recommend other professionals embarking on something similar? Yes, um, I think that there is nothing more valuable than work experience. Showing the willing and understanding of what it's like to have a job, uh, let alone a job in the right sector, is hugely important. Uh, Just knowing how to sort of behave in a workplace, it shows that you've been there and done that. And then anything that's allied to a career that you are interested in. So say you want to be an editor in sport or a sports journalist. Even having uh, any sort of experience at sort of a local paper or setting up your own blog or setting up your own podcast is a huge is a huge tick for anyone looking at your CV. Taking on every opportunity that you can, you know, and volunteering is a fantastic uh, way of doing that because normally you get more responsibility (laughs) because you're a small team and, you know, you've got to really muck in or or running your own project. Uh, It's huge. So my placements weren't necessarily directly related to broadcasting at all. I mean, yes, when I worked with England Rugby, that was video analysis. So it does show that you have some technical skill, but it's not uh, not targeted the same way as looking after a TV production. And likewise, Team Bath was mainly shouting at athletes and taking blood, which is a bit different. <laughs> but it showed that you could commit to the same sort of hours, you could work with the same kind of people. And, you know, just things like basic IT skills and things like that, you know, it's, it's a huge value. This is Pitch Talks. The next two guests that I want to look back to is Rebecca Lucy Locke and Gareth Farrelly, both who got into sport through elite performance. Rebecca was a former athlete and struggled to adapt to redefine her purpose once the time had come to retire and shared the different challenges every athlete, no matter what their specialism, is faced with. So this is exactly what we found out. If you're an athlete listening to this or looking to get into an elite performance scene, this will be really beneficial. You're listening to Pitch Talks, bringing you the game. I'm glad you did just bring it up because, you know, you could just see there the amount of passion that you have to support athletes going through a similar process to what you had in terms of redefining your goals. And that's one of the main reasons, obviously, that you set up Lock in purpose. From what you said, is that a lot of what you try and drive through to these younger athletes or athletes who are now at the stage where, unfortunately, they have to come out of competing, but now trying to redefine, okay, what's next for me? Yeah, I mean, Lock and Purpose is really, really new. And there's kind of three main areas that I'm looking at. I'm working with athletes that are having to look at that next journey. And quite often we talk about plan B, which is just so wrong to say because it is just life, right? It's just there's always going to be life after sport you know it doesn't mean you're never going to be you're not going to play recreationally or be an age group athlete but 
to have it as your sole focus, you know, there is going to be other life. So for starters, I think we should never call it plan B um, because it almost feels like, you know, plan A didn't work, right? So I have to go to plan B. So you didn't fail. It's just coming. It's run its course. So yes, helping individuals transfer into their next journey and how that looks like and how to define it is mainly what lock and purpose is about and that does that doesn't matter where you are in that spectrum so you could be an age group athlete a young athlete that is working with your support network i.e coaches and parents on building yourself up as a person around sport so that whenever that does happen and you need to leave it you've got all the tools there it could be the fact that you are a you know um, an adult professional and you've got a career ending injury which i'm working with at the moment which is horrendous because you don't you know see it coming it might just be that you run its course it could be due to you know often athletes go through a lot of trauma in terms of not succeeding where they want to go or having some of the more we'll say traditional sports have a bit of an archaic coaching pathway and that can really damage athletes so it's helping them understand the transition after that but also elite coaches that like me I went straight from being an elite athlete to an elite coach high performance coach really just you you run it all in there's no there was never any transition into being a coach and then got to 35 and was like whoa who am I what am I doing and having to go through that like never sat in an office before never gone to an interview you know, outside of a, a, a tracksuit setting, as they say, I hate that wording, but you know what I mean? You know, all those little things that just kind of seem normal for some people are completely alien to us. So yeah, essentially lock and purpose is to kind of help all of those transitions and and support individuals on that journey. This is Pitch Talks. As I mentioned a moment ago, like Rebecca, Gareth Farrelly was another who got into the sport industry through playing sport professionally. In this case, football. From representing the likes of Aston Villa and Everton to playing for his country, Republic of Ireland. His story is so fascinating. Going from being a footballer to a lawyer is quite a transition. But what was also great and what I'm about to share with you today is the advice he offered people looking to become footballers or just breaking into the industry. What advice would you give to someone, whether it be during their playing professional career or going back into education or now looking to get involved from a different way as in working within business? I think you have to be clear about what you want. I think you have to ask for help. And I think you have to identify mentors or people in that particular sector that have the ability to guide you through it. Everybody's experience will be their own. I had role models when I played football, right? I ended up playing with a lot of them. Some of them are friends now, but equally in the legal profession now, I have the same. I have role models, people who I look to that I say I want to be at the same level as they are. They've had 20 years head start on me. Don't get me wrong. You have to think about it slightly differently. But obviously, it's important to still, you know, maintain that kind of ambition and drive, irrespective of where you want to get to. But I think you need to be quite strategic about it because, you know, again, we're back to commercial awareness. You're back to like from a lawyer, you're back to different things about like career opportunities, career guidance. Everybody will tell you, oh, you know what I mean? It's it's going to be easy. It's going to be great. You're going to be able to do this. Employabilities are incredibly high levels, but it's all challenging, but it's, it's equally competitive and challenging for everybody. So I think having a plan and being clearly defined in what you want to do, identifying the people that work in that sector that you have the potential to maybe seek to tap into or engage with, and then be willing to ask. You're listening to Pitch Talks. Thomas Junod was another really, really fantastic episode. He's the head of UEFA Academy and he gave us an idea on what UEFA really look at when they're looking for applications. He mentioned about the importance of work experience and when you're trying to get into the sport industry, there's no excuse for not being able to get some voluntary work with the amount of different opportunities available. Just carrying on along the theme of sort of your your non-sports-based roles, is that something that you would advise anyone who is starting out to sort of try and diversify your career experience to try and pick up 
soft skills or or transferable skills from outside of the world of sports so that you have that you can then bring them back into to a role within sport not necessarily but i would say two things here uh the first is there are more and more programs bachelor degree or master degrees offering specialization in sports management I would not advise, for instance, to enroll in a bachelor degree. I think it's too early. I think a very good management programs where potentially, because you like sport, you do all your assignment, your group work around sports is more interesting because you close less door at an early stage in your career. There is really a fantastic sports management program, but a really good management programs is opening more door, more opportunities, and you can still specialize later on. But in parallel of this, and this is the second thing I'd like people remember, uh, <laughs> is that sport is a very special industry where it's probably one of the only industry where you don't have the excuse of not having experience when you apply, I would say, for a job at UEFA. Because there are so many opportunities to work, maybe in a voluntary position in, in the world of sports. Think about all the sports events organized in local community. You can easily be the treasurer for this event or the president or the secretary or the volunteers manager for these events. And you will accumulate a lot of experience. And if it's not in events, is in the club of your region, of your city, uh, where you have the possibility again to become a coach or to become in charge of the youth movement or of being in charge of, I don't know, the, the catering for the club or whatever. Uh, but you have a lot of opportunities to be confronted in a professional environment or at least to, to deliver, to accumulate sports administration experience. And I would never hire someone at UEFA who has not this experience. So I don't really care if it was a paid or non-paid experience, but I would require even for a young person uh, applying to UEFA that they they made their experience, that they prove their passion for sport in, in being a volunteer for this kind of organization because there is a lot of needs uh, for this organization. This organization needs people and there is no better place to learn the soft skills or even the hard skills than this place, actually. This is Pitch Talks. Richard Allen was a fantastic guest. As other than sharing his experience of sharing a gym with Adam PT and his cool down of 500 chin-ups, I mean, don't we all? We found out what a day in the life of being a director of football at Loughborough Uni actually means. From the glamour of washing bibs to speaking with the likes of Rude Hillett, this job is really the cliche of not one day is the same. Being in and around students all day, he is often asked his advice for pursuing a passion as a career. And this is one we also wanted to find out. What career advice would you give to those looking to break into the sports industry, whether it's competing as an elite sports person or getting to work in the sports industry, like the passion you had at the very beginning of your career? Yeah, so I remember I was thinking about this. I remember once at Tottenham we had um, Rud Hullet came. I think his son was playing and um, he wanted to come and watch him in the indoor area. And we didn't really let people in the dome um, and we didn't let parents in, but he's Rud Hullet. So, you know, we thought we'd give him a bit of squeeze. So anyway, he, I said to him, yeah, you can. But will you talk to our boys at the end of the game? Yeah, yeah, no problem. So that question was asked, you know, what's the one thing that we need to do? And, you know, I think people would imagine saying, you've got to be technically excellent. You've got to work on your skills. You've got to be this. And he just said, you've got to work really hard. You've got to work hard. And the boys are like, what? You've got to work hard. That's what you need to do. And, and I know that sounds, you know, a little bit, but you do. You, to get anywhere in life, you've got to work really, really hard. You've got to be committed to it in a healthy way. I think you've got to be obsessed. You know, I don't think in sport, especially whether you're playing or whether you're in anything else or coaching, it becomes obsessive and you need to be able to do it. People say about, yeah, but what about work-life balance? Forget it. I'm, I'm not being funny. Unfortunately, it's really hard to, to do that within the environment that we work in. And I think people going into clubs would suddenly find it really, really hard because it, yeah, there is a time during the summer where everybody just disappears, but most of the time it's 24 seven full on. It's loads of benefits. There are loads of highs, there are massive lows. It, it's quite volatile. 
it's really, really hard, but you've got, you know, you've just got to work really, really hard. And, and I think, you know, I, I've tried to do that and it's, you know, paid dividends. Now, clearly you need to have some skill and expertise in the areas that you want to do. But for me, it, it is about, you know, doing the hard yards. I talked about the fact that it's taken me 20 years, you know, that I washed the kit, that I drove the minibus. I, I think what happens now is people get opportunities within the club. And I used to have it. I remember an analyst saying to me, um, oh, well, I've been an intern. You've given me a job. Thank you. But I've got a master's. I'm better qualified. Than when can I go with the first team? You've only been here a year and a half. Give, give it a break. You know, you. I'm not saying you have to wait 20 years, but you, there is a bit about serving your time and learning and becoming an expert and becoming credible. And, and I think, you know, if, if you're in that kind of environment, you've got to do it. I think as a player, I think it is, you know, there are so many things that come into being a really good football player. Most of those things that, you know, you learn and develop over time. Uh, and maybe being patient. I think it's you've got to be impatient now. You can't, you know, young players might go into the under 23s and, you know, can you wait it out? You know, have you got the stamina to stay within the system? I think is quite important. So, yes, I'm not sure that really helps, but um, I, I think working hard, developing your contacts, your networks, you know, never saying no to any, any opportunity that comes along. Um, I asked somebody to do something for me the other day and he couldn't do it. And, it, you know, no, no problem. I just asked somebody else guess what, I'll go back to that person now and get him to come and do it. And that person who said no. So yeah, you can't always because things come up. But when I was getting involved, I'd say, yes, yeah, I can do it. Yes, I can do it. Yes, I can do it. Then I'd have to work out, oh, I can't really, oh, yeah, how am I going to do that? And I, and I would make you know every effort to do it. And um, guess what, they keep coming back. You're listening to Pitch Talks. Bringing you the game. Our final guest I want to talk about is Adi Oladipo. I'm still pinching myself that this actually happened. When we were planning pitch talks just about a year ago, I was watching Good Morning Transfers on Sky Sports and Addy was one of the reporters. And it led me to think, what is it like being a sports reporter in front of thousands, perhaps millions of people watching? But what actually happens when your laptop dies on your TV debut? So as well as finding out how we recovered, we also find out how he to establish yourself as a respected freelance presenter. So the difference of preparing for Sky and Talk Sport, and then what also career advice he would offer for those looking to become commentators or reporters in the future. What final career advice would you give to aspiring sports commentators, reporters, content creators, or anyone that's just looking to get into something that they've loved from an early age? I think first and foremost, love the sport you're following, right? I mean, if you do want to get into a broadcaster as a football journalist, love football, like really love it with a passion. I mean, I I love boxing. I would do what I do for my YouTube channel for free. You don't, I mean, you don't have to pay me a dime to do it. I'd go to boxing events. I used to turn out, I used to turn up outside boxing events with a camera and try and just get a sneaky interview of Eddie Hearn and Frank Warren. I remember those of things like they were yesterday. Um, you've got to love you've got to have a passion for sports, not necessarily a passion for broadcasting, but a passion for sports because your passion for sports will get you in the door. And then your skill as a broadcaster will make you stay in the door, so to speak. Don't be afraid of doing some free work. I think there is this, there's a stigma about doing free work now because oh, is it free labor? It's okay. We've done a bit of free work. We've all done work experience somewhere. And I think um, some people hate the idea of doing free work because no, no, I should be paid for my services you will eventually get paid for your services, but you can't beat a bit of a bit of experience in, in doing something. Approach local radio stations, broadcasting stations, and even newspapers. There is so much work available in these local stations. I think everyone at the start, and I understand it, trust me, I do, wants to go for the big boys. I get it. Um, I was lucky enough to go to London Live, small channel, Arise News, small channel you can get so much experience working for these, these smaller channels that yes, they might not pay the same amount as the big broadcaster, but they will get you in the door. They will get you in the door. And then eventually you work your way up. I think a lot of people want to jump before they can walk. And it, it, there's, there's no reason to be okay with going abroad. It sounds crazy, but I've, I know so many broadcasters now that have worked abroad and are happy to do it just because it's a different experience. It's a different terrain. Things are done differently. And 
that can only stand you in good stead when you come back here. It's it's so different working abroad than it is in this country. Everything they do is different. A different voice in your ear, a different way in which they produce shows. So don't be afraid of doing that as well. Don't worry about not having a degree in journalism or degree in English language or degree in English literature. I think everyone thinks like, okay, we need to rubber stamp those things. You don't. I mean, not just me, but there's so many other people that live in proof that even if you don't have those things, you can still get into the broadcast world. It, it, it very much is possible. And always reach out for advice. I'm lucky. I've got a couple of mentors. I've got uh, Darren Lewis, assistant editor of The Mirror, who I reach out to all the time to speak to. And he gives me great advice. I've got Mike Wedderburn that I reach out to as well. I've got so many of these people that I'm okay to kind of put my ego at the door and say, okay, I know nothing about this industry. Like, can I follow your path? And they're always good for advice as well. So look, it's a wonderful industry to get into. It's a ridiculously competitive industry to get into, but there are so many ways to get into it. it there, there's so many avenues now to get into it as well. I mean, start a YouTube, start a podcast, do everything you can do to kind of make your way in it before you are eventually in it. And look, reach out to someone like me for advice. I, I'm so happy to give people advice, by the way. I mean, I don't know if you can leave my contact details somehow for people on here to kind of reach out to me, but I'm more than happy to help people because when I was coming up, people helped me. And I think without that, it's kind of difficult to get in this industry. But once you're in, it's fun. I'm having the time of my life going to some of the biggest events for free. It's ridiculous. I'm going to England, Scotland on Friday. Well, I don't know when it's going to come out. Apologies. But I'm going to England, Scotland at the Euros. I've covered some of the biggest Anthony Joshua fights in Saudi Arabia and America. And I have to go back to my hotel sometimes. And I'll be honest with you, this is probably a bit bit sad here, but sometimes I do shed a tear. Like how, how, like, this is incredible. Like how have I got to the point where I'm, I'm covering some of the biggest sporting events in the world? It, it's, it's crazy. Uh, and then I kind of say, well, well no, it's, it, you put the work in as well. So it's kind of, it's a bit of a dream right now and I'm still living it. And I'm excited to live it. And when you guys ask me to come, it's like, well, what, you want me? Ade, it's, it's unbelievable. So um, thanks for having me on. So that is the end of our career special episode with Pitch Talks. Next Tuesday, we'll be bringing you another guest from inside the sports industry, hearing about their compelling stories and experiences in their day-to-day -day role. If you've enjoyed today's episode, then there are so many more of our episodes to get stuck into. Whether you're looking to become a football agent, understand the inner workings of sports sponsorship, or knowing what gets people interacting in marketing, there are so many career episodes available right now. If you have some feedback on today's episode, Make sure to leave us your review on our Apple podcast page or give us a follow on our social channels. This has been Pitch Talks, the sports career podcast focused on helping you get into sport. Thank you for listening to another episode of Bringing You the Game by Pitch Talks. For more information on our latest episodes, careers advice, or to even get involved as a guest, get in touch with the team at mitch at pitch-talks.com or send us a message on any of our social platforms. Thanks for tuning in. Bringing you the game. Bringing you the game. Pitch Talks. All Pitch Talks content is copyright protected. Pitch Talks.